uh, holding the book, An American Soldier. Uh, this is a story about her father, my grandfather. The gentleman next to us is my cousin, John Della Justina, whose mother was my mom's sister, Sharon. And uh, John was the one responsible, is the one responsible for putting this book together. Uh, John is uh, a West Point graduate. Uh, he uh, served over 20 years in the Army, uh, retired lieutenant colonel. He had uh, most of his experience was in intelligence. Uh, while he was in the military, he got his uh, master's degree in history from the University of West Virginia. And one of his kind of pet projects was taking my grandfather's diary from World War I and also some of the letters that correspondence between me and his family, and putting it together in a book for him. Uh, John had written a couple other books. Uh, he, he lives in uh, Tucson, or outside of Tucson, Arizona, and uh, he's had lived there for probably you know, almost 40 years. And uh, he has uh, had a real love with that area. So he's written some books on the uh, American military and the Apaches in that area. And uh, so, but this was a project that he always had at his heart. So uh, John, uh, is, as I said, is retired at this point. He still is a consultant. Uh, with military folks down in the Sierra Vista area, if any of you know where that's at. Uh, I'd like to th uh, thank those of you uh, who serve. Uh, thank you for your service. Uh, it's an important thing for my wife and I. Uh, my stepson just recently retired after 20 years in the military last June. Uh, he served in Korea for a year. He had uh, two combat tours in Iraq, including in the invasion, and two in Afghanistan. Uh, my wife's brother, who also was a Woodwest uh, Point graduate, served 20 years in the military, and except for during Desert Storm when he did some logistics over in Germany, he missed out on, on any action. So uh, when my stepson joined, uh, he went to ROTC at Michigan State. Uh, when he uh, went in and back in 98, I guess he had no idea what was going to happen in the next couple of years, but had quite a bit of different experience. We're very proud of him. I would probably mention that because uh, it just shows the kind of service that people put in. And again, for those of you who serve, or a family that served, thank you. Uh, this is a story called An American Soldier in the Great War. And uh, it came about because, not just because of my cousin's uh, pet project, but for a couple of very important reasons. Number one, my grandfather kept a diary during the 1989, when he was still in the States, till when the war was finished, and, uh, and he ended up spending a little bit more time in France, as I'll get to later. Uh, the other thing that was very important is his older sister, who he was in correspondence with quite, quite a bit, quite a bit, uh, ended up uh, keeping his letters of correspondence. And so she had them for years, and the diary. Those two survived over a long period of time. My grandfather had his father uh, build a chest to put his stuff in when he went overseas, his, his uh, uh, clothes and uh, uniform and other things. When he came back, he came back with a lot of, of uh, souvenirs as well as his own equipment. And uh, as a young boy growing up, I remember going up in the attic and opening up grandpa's uh, chest and looking inside and seeing the things that he brought back in his uniform. We're very fortunate. All that stuff has has uh, survived, and uh, in the book there are pictures of many of the things that uh, are still here over a hundred years after the event. Uh, the other important thing uh, that happened is he survived a very serious wound. In June of 1918, he was wounded. I uh, had a piece of shrapnel enter his back from an exploding bomb, and. Uh, and ended up going into convalescence for about seven weeks. Uh, afterwards, he went back to the front, back to his job, which was uh, running wire for the, uh, uh, the artillery and commanding the switchboard. Uh, so if we're very fortunate. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here talking at this point if he hadn't. But it was serious enough that it affected him for his whole life because the shrapnel was so close to his heart they decided, the doctors decided to not remove it. When he came back, even many years later, they didn't want to touch it. It was within, I think, about a, a half inch of his heart. So it was very, very close. It was in an area near the lungs, so it caused some pulmonary uh, problems for him, too. 
Uh, and as I said, uh, John, uh, this was his pet project. He put it together. Uh, he was inspired by a number of people, including my mom, and, and uh, had a lot of support uh, from those of us in the family who wanted to see this come to fruition. Uh, the other thing is that John was really uh, adamant about finding a publisher. Uh, he went to a number of different uh, publishers and finally found one through Hellgate Press. And uh, fortunately, now the book's been, been published, and I do have copies here today, too. So I, when I met Chris last summer and he invited me here, it was 95 degrees. We were down at Grass Lake, and they were doing a, a 100th anniversary of the end of World War One, and uh, he invited me up here, and I appreciate that. Uh, I had hoped to come around Armistice Day, but, uh, or I'm sorry, Veterans Day, and Armistice is how my grandpa would have known it, of course, and uh, many of us still think it that way, but uh, I think uh, uh, the, uh, the thing that comes to me at this point that I'm happy about is it, it, there's another big anniversary coming up on May 13th. 1918 or 1919, so it's coming up next month, the 100th anniversary of when the uh, 119th Field Artillery, 32nd Division, came into Lansing and there was a big parade. We'll see uh, a couple pictures of that shortly. What unit was you? I'm sorry? What unit did you say? He was in the uh, 32nd Division, 119th Field Artillery. Oh, okay. Okay, and that was uh, a unit that was out of Lansing, and I'll kind of get to his personal story in a little bit, but it was a unit that originated out of Lansing in the Michigan National Guard at the time. So I want to just uh, move on to a couple other photos and talk about a few things. By the way, in case I didn't mention it, I don't think I did, uh, if you have questions, please raise your hand and you can, of course you can answer them. If you want to wait to the end, that's fine. Uh, it's not going to disturb me either way. Um, and, and, and as we go along, if you have some personal stories of your family who may have been in World War I or what you know about them, uh, please be, feel free to share that too. Okay, let's see if I can get this to work. Uh, no, it's not going If you don't mind, I, and I know it might be difficult for that, but uh, I'll use my teacher voice here. Let's see if I can find, where's the cursor? And where is the next picture? Ah, oh, there it is. Okay. All right. This is a picture of my uh, grandfather back about 1904, from what we can figure. He's uh, the young man right here. He was born uh, in a Wheeler Township that's about 45 miles northwest of Lansing. And uh, Wheeler Township uh, it has a small town in Harlan. It's about probably 20 miles east of St. Louis, Michigan, if you know where that is, uh, yeah, north of uh, Lansing. The kids look well behaved. They do. They also, the problem what is happening is, unless you sit down for the picture, you don't get any food. <laughs> yeah, here's a picture of my grandfather. My grandfather, uh, at, shortly after he was born, the family moved to Ovid, Michigan which again is northeast of Lansing, and my grand, great-grandfather, Wilfred Frederick Smith, uh, bought 80 acres and they moved there. And he had been a farmer his whole life, and so my grandfather grew up in a rural community, farming was part of his life. In the early 19th century, uh, he only needed an eighth grade education, and so this is a picture probably a couple of years before he matriculated out of the eighth grade. He's right there, does not look real happy. My grandfather wasn't a real, academic person in the sense of having a lot of schooling, but he loved history, and I think that's something that he passed on to me and to John, uh, that we both enjoy it very much. He had tons of books, and of course a lot of things about World War I. Uh, so in this picture, as near as I can tell, it's probably, probably about 10 or 11 years old. And of course everybody looks happy. <laughs> Here he is, the, the teenager, all dressed up for the big night on town in downtown Ovid for a dance or something like that. Of course, this is his main experience uh, as a, on the farm between farming and working with horses. Now, as many of you probably know from World War I, horses were a big part of everything. And when they found out that he worked on a farm and worked with horses, it's like, we've got a job for you. 
<clears throat> that got him in trouble when they were in France because evidently he abused a horse and was being put up on court martial charges until they found out that just the next day they were moving out to the front. And then they decided, well, we can use you. And, and so that's at least one of the things you'll read about in the book. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what abuse the horse was, but it, maybe that's part of the Smith impatience that I've inherited. Uh, this is a picture of uh, my grandfather at his best friend's uh, apartment at the University of Michigan. Uh, his best friend growing up, a couple of years older than he was, is uh, was Frank Nethaway. So you'll read about letters of correspondence between Frank and my grandfather. And Frank Nethaway lived just basically the next farm over on the corner of, I can't remember the road, but Nethaway uh, Drive. And so he was also from a farming, but he ended up going to uh, University of Michigan, getting a degree in engineering, and then working for General Motors for a number of years. Uh, he ended up also uh, marrying my grandfather's older sister, Selma, who we'll get to in just a minute. So this is the family picture. Uh, you can tell everybody's really happy. Uh, this is my great-grandfather, Wilfred Frederick Smith, uh, Olive Smith, his wife, my grandfather, his older sister, uh, Zelma. And Zelma was born in 1894, my grandfather in 1897. Uh, then his next oldest brother, Clarence, D, and the youngest, Genevieve, in the family. And then there'll be a picture of them a little later as they've aged a little bit. This is probably just uh, the year before he moved into, uh, our, or moved into Lansing, or maybe the year that he moved into Lansing to go to Lansing Business College. Uh, for those of us in the area, it, it's a, it's, it was around for many years. It's no longer there. Lansing Community College has basically uh, become that entity. And he went to school there, but again, he wasn't real academically inclined. And in the, in the uh, diary of the first chapter, you'll hear about a bored young man in a lively town, but who misses home a little bit and uh, moves from job to job and from house to house. And then, of course, World War I comes along and everything changes. This is his picture, uh, his military picture from 1918. Uh, he trained in a couple places in Lansing. Uh, initially, they trained at the Artillery Battery, which is in downtown <laughs> Lansing, right near the current Capitol building. Uh, then they also trained over in this area. Now, this building was not here at the time. It was just a big field. Uh, it was called Camp Hope Field. And uh, if you go on some old maps, turn of the century, there's actually an area there. And I, we didn't it? go to Battle Creek? And then we're getting to that. Yep. Oh, yep, 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 yep. And uh, as many of them did. You're right. So what I, the reason I put this on is this building came up many years later. Well, 1924 was when it was built. And it became called the Marshall Street Armory. And Marshall Street Armory, I remember my grandpa taking me over there because he loved rocks and gems, and they always had a rock and gem show, and they usually had something else. It's still there. Actually, the building as it looks right now, it's been renovated. It, in I the, think I've been there once. You probably have. It's, it's right in, uh, on the east side of Lansing, not too far off the highway. Uh, in 19, uh, in, in, excuse me, in 2007, it was decommissioned. And a lot of people, including one of our major developers in the area, Gillespie Group, was kind of upset that this beautiful building was just kind of falling into disrepair. So Gillespie bought it, has refitted it. It's got offices and all sorts of meeting rooms in the area. This one lit area that's on the left side of the building, as you look at it, is a large hall that can be rented out. I've been to a couple weddings there. Uh, not weddings, but uh, uh, what do you call it after the wedding? Reception. Reception, thank you. Uh, underneath the building, it's, it, at one time it was all open because in 1924 they still brought the horses down, down underneath. They don't do that anymore, so unfortunately. And this was the parade I was telling you about. Uh, Tuesday morning, May 13, 1919. It's the 119th Field Artillery. They had just come back from France and they just uh, had this. Uh, from France to New York to Lansing area, they had this big parade, and then two later, <coughs> days later, they got mustered out. To answer your question, after he was at Camp Hogue and, and the uh, Michigan uh, National Guard be, became part of the U.S. Army, and uh, oh. so they were sent first to uh, Camp Grayling for um, 
uh, field artillery, and it was it was around at that time. Oh, really? And then they went to camp, and then they went to Waco, Texas, for further training down there before they were sent over to Europe. <laughs> when he came back, he was mustered out at Fort Custer, or Camp Custer, I think it was. It was called. Oh, yeah. What is that now? You go I think so. Uh, it was somewhere in New York area, so it could be. Could have been. Yep. And they went to England for a very short period of time and then over to France. Actually the La Havre. I, I took this picture in because uh, my mom and I were going through some pictures many a couple years ago and I'm trying to digitalize things. It's a little blurry, but it's the it's the Smith family on the Smith family farm up in Old. And my grandfather, great grandfather, grandmother will sell it in a couple of years and then we'll go over to Perry, Michigan. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there's my grandfather right there. There's Frank Nethaway, his best friend. Uh, and this young man next to him is uh, my Uncle Dee, my grandfather's younger brother, and he's wearing an overseas cap. Oh, yeah. grandfather got home in May of 1919. He had been gone for over a year, uh, pretty much away from the family. And it, as you can see on his overseas cap, he's got that little Michigan National Guard. They were allowed to keep that and use that. But he slept in that hat. He probably did. He probably did. Uh, kind of giving you an overview, and then we'll focus on his war experience. Uh, or I'll focus on his war experience. This, this Dapper young man here and the, the beautiful young woman. This is my grandpa, of course, and his uh, his wife, my grandma, Marge, Marjorie Belay, and uh, they were married in 1932. And very shortly thereafter, along came my aunt Sharon, and then my mom, and then my uncle Steve. A uh, happy looking group of guys. When my grandfather came back, one of the guys, that, one of his buddies, ended up getting a job at the post office. Well, most of those guys up there are veterans of the po of World War I. Uh, it became kind of a, I don't want to say good old boys club, but it definitely became uh, something that if you served in the service, chances are you could get a job at the post office. He did the same thing in the Civil War as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I, I fully support that. Those guys had already paid their dues. Yeah. That's my, I threw that in because that's my mom. My mom, uh, bless her, is still alive, 83, going to be 83 next month, and uh, doing well. And uh, that's a picture of her probably about 1937 because she's pretty small. And here's my mom. I think, oh, <coughs> sorry, guys. There we go. Uh, this is my Aunt Sharon. Uh, she's about a year and a half older than my mom. Uh, my Aunt Sharon is John Della Justina's mother. So my grandfather, although he didn't live to see them all, had nine grandchildren. Uh, there were eight boys and one girl, and we all felt sorry for my sister because every time that there'd be another baby to be born, because she was third in line, she was so hopeful it was a girl. And I can still remember when my sixth cousin was born, she just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. So it's tough. But uh, as I said, I was fortunate enough growing up, uh, my grandfather passed away in 1968 at the age of 71, and I fortunately got to know him for 12 years. And he was my best buddy. Yes, I think most grandfathers are. I included this because for my grandfather, one of the things that he really enjoyed when he came back was camping outside and being in the North Woods. So this is my grandma. This is her cousin, Curly Murder, who lives in, lived in Traverse City, Michigan. And Curly found some property outside of Traverse City, Michigan, a, a small lake called Spider Lake. There's Spider, Arbutus, Bass, Rennie, a couple different lakes in there. And he built this cabin by, by hand and uh, by himself. And uh, so this is one of the great pleasures of his, in his 
life, uh, as well as the friends and family as in there. This is a picture from the lake of the cabin over to the side. Um, the cabin, uh, my, as I said, my grandfather passed away in 1968. My uh, father and I loved to go up in the fall coho fishing. And in 1973, we went up there and stoked up the old Franklin stove on the old cabin and went in town fishing. And we came back, stopped at the grocery store to grab some half gallon of milk. And my dad came out and said, they said the Smith Place is burned down on the, on the lake. Oh, and uh, we, we thought, well, there's three Smiths on the lake, so maybe it won't be out. So we drove in and it had burned down. The good news is that my dad, the next year, built the cottage a new cottage, and, uh, and here it is, 45 years later, still standing, we still own it, we still go to Spider Lake, we're going to probably go open up the cottage probably early next month. It doesn't look like the weather's real cooperative out there. This picture of my grandfather and grandmother, and of course me as a baby coming along, 1956, or the oldest, and another picture of us, my mom in the background, my dad, my sister Julie, my grandpa. That looks like a Norman Rockwell uh, photo. Photo, does it? Yeah, sure does. Tell you, well, what's amazing is, I don't know why, but this picture was taken at our name, at my grandpa's neighbor's house. So, I, as near as I can tell, I think we're all dressed up, so it's probably Easter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your grandpa was quite old. He, got married, married too. He, he did. He, well, he got married, he got married shortly after he came back from the war, and uh, the story is that, uh, the family story is that his wife didn't want to have any children. He wanted to have kids. And eventually that became a, a real oh, sore point. Oh, okay, so he, okay. he divorced and then met my, actually it was my grandmother's mailman. I know a woman her dad was a World War One veteran. I said, yeah, you kid. Yeah. Well, he must have had kids when he was in the 60s. Yeah. yeah. My grandfather was fairly old. This is a picture of the Smith family. You saw the earlier picture when we were younger. Uh, my grandfather, of course, is oops, his older <laughs> sister. There we go. His older sister, uh, my Aunt Selma, Clarence, me, and Genevieve. Uh, they, they're all since gone. Uh, you know, they've all since passed away. But uh, um, yeah, I remember growing up and being familiar. And, uh, they were a couple of my favorite people. Here I am as a young boy. We've added my brother to the picture now, Matt. Is that a uh, Boy Scout suit? Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's a Cub Scout suit or something they did at the time. And this is out in the backyard, my grandfather. And my grandmother and grandfather in his favorite car. Uh, the story I want to tell you is about the time we went over to the lumber yard, got some lumber, and he couldn't fit it in the trunk or he couldn't fit it in the back, so he stuck it <laughs> crosswise through the side window into the back window. And you know what happened when we came in the driveway and got too close to the house. Yeah, we put it right through the back window. This is just a, a year before my grandfather passed away. He's, he's looking pretty skinny, not feeling really good. Uh, they're out visiting John and his older brother Danny and younger brother David out in Massachusetts uh, at my Aunt Sharon's. And this is just before he passed away. He, this is a, 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 a graduation party for the lady that's looking at the closest to us uh, for her daughter. And uh, everybody was shocked when my grandfather came in because he had a, a very serious heart attack back in February. And this is May. Everybody was just amazed that he came in. Uh, he would die that, uh, that October, or that November. Mm -hmm. And there we are, the year after mm -hmm. Grandpa passed away. There are now seven of us, and there'll be two more a couple years afterwards. But uh, uh, happy family, uh, supporting my grandma at the house where uh, pretty much uh, my mom and aunt and uncle grew up and where we would go to Grandma and Grandpa's, which is this one over on Miller Road on the south side of Lansing. So anyway, I wanted to share those pictures with you. And I think maybe the PowerPoint I can operate the, from up front. We'll give it a try. Come on. In. Technology, I tell you, this is just the best stuff. And when it doesn't work or the power goes out, we're in big trouble. <laughs> Did they have any, um, the most people in your neighborhood were in your neighborhood? Yes, yes. Most of the people that served in the 119th Field Artillery 
uh, and, and came from that part of Mid Michigan. Oh, wow. okay, from the beginning. I didn't know that. I was thinking of that, but I didn't think. All right, well, let me see if I can get this to work up here. I think it will. Uh, and do probably most of you know about this? The, no. You know the the idea of trying to get a World War One memorial built in Washington, D.C., and there's the area, but there hasn't been any appropriations yet for it. So I know that's, when I was at Grass Lake and met Chris last summer, there was a gentleman there who's in charge of that that happened to stop in and came all the way from Washington, D.C. So it's, it's a pretty big deal. But uh, you, can, you can see my grandfather's uh, unit's designation over there, uh, and that was something that was come up with, I believe, after World War I. But, uh, he served as a private first class in the 119th Field Artillery Regiment in the 32nd, which is sometimes known as the Red Arrow Division. Okay, I did something with the... Uh, there it is. Let's see if I can get this to work. Maybe this one? There we go. Okay. And you've seen the family. This is a picture of the farm, which is no longer standing. Uh, however, the barn, you can drive up there on, on, uh, off of Nethaway Drive, and you can still see the barn. At least it was there a couple years ago. I, I meant to go up this year and check on it. And uh, some idea of the, of, the, of the farm itself, this creek off to the side. My grandfather, when he was a boy, of course, they plowed the field. Uh, this area along the creek had been used by indigenous peoples for, Lord knows, maybe thousands of years. So one of his hobbies as a kid was collecting arrowheads and other, uh, you know, Native American artifacts that he found. So this is something before he passed away that he did. He he made this board and mounted the arrowheads to it. John has it right now. And that's that part of his inheritance, and he's actually added some other arrowheads that he's got from out in the southwest. Judd Bill that's the one I'm thinking of. So this was kind of a passion of my grandpa. So besides history, he really was interested in Native American. That's a lot of property there. That is. Okay, probably some of you, I, I think Mike, is yes. it? You yes. mentioned about the yes. different ones. So um, let me check my notes here. Um, The top two, we think, are Camp Grayling when they were up there. Uh, in, uh, when they went to Camp Grayling, as it is still used today, a lot of it for artillery purposes. Uh, obviously, it's with an artillery unit, field artillery unit, so they're doing a lot of that up there. Uh, when he first was, when he was training in Lansing, uh, he trained with uh, a unit that would have been assigned a gun, a gun crew. And, uh, uh, however, when he went to, uh, I believe it was in Camp Grayling to Waco, this is Waco down in the bottom half of Texas, where they went for further training with other units. He was uh, reassigned to headquarters, and uh, at, at that point he was then assigned to communications. So instead of working with a gun crew, his job was running communication wire uh, setting up the switchboard or the telephone, whatever was going to be used. And that's what he did when he was over in France. So instead of working at an actual gun battery, he worked at, a, at, at the communications, setting it up, and then also manning it too. Battery D, roster of officers and soldiers. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that have made have these, again, that have ancestors that, that fought. Uh, here's some pictures of my grandfather, and uh, we think that uh, uh, it's in, he's in his field uniform with a garrison or overseas cap. Uh, he does have the steel doughboy cap and his helmet and gas mask. And by the way, all that we still have. We've got his helmet, his gas mask, and, and other things. So that was something that he got to bring home with him. Yeah. And uh, my mom has done a great job of mounting a lot of these things. She's got part of the basement set up specifically with all the stuff that we brought back. And this is at Fort MacArthur in Waco, Texas. Well, it, it, you'll read about it in the book, but he got a camera. 
but he had to split the cost of the camera with his best friend Frank. Frank lent it to him so he could at least use it for this. So this is some of the first pictures that he took when he was in Waco. You can see in the upper left-hand corner his helmet. There, if you look very clear, closely in the middle, there is a red arrow with a cross. And the idea of the 32nd Red Arrow Division is that they burst through the line. So that's, that's kind of their, their uh, model. The inside of the helmet, uh, it's overseas cap, it's gas mask. His little, oh, the, uh, the leggings. Like the spats. Yep, the spats. <laughs> yep, thank you. And of course, his, his uniform and overcoat. Those were all things that he used when he was overseas that we still have. Uh, here we go. Uh, it, you have the, in the upper left, the circular bronze pin of the overseas cap with the Michigan designation on it. Uh, then, I'm trying to see which one this is, uh, the Enlisted Soldiers Grand Prix, which has got cross cannons for the Field Artillery Corps, and they would have been on the left collar of his, his uh, uniform. Enlisted, and then the next thing is Enlisted Soldiers Bronze Pin, it says U.S., denoting regular army, that would have been on the right side of the collar. Uh, and then the next is Enlisted Soldiers U.S. Uniform Eagle Button. That's at the very bottom right there. Uh, then over on the um, other side, it's, and I think my, my notes are mixed up here, there are two overseas combat chevrons uh, that would have appeared on the left cuff. cuff. And then um, the uh, other one is the, the, the upside down chevron, the single one, is a wound chevron that they would have received. And that would have been something that would have denoted uh, uh, being wounded during the war. This would be replaced a couple of years later, of course, by the, by the uh, Purple Cross, or the Purple Heart. And then, then the, of course, is on his shoulder, you've got the red air, 32nd Red Arrow Division shoulder sleeve insignia, and his red private first class chevron. Okay, in the upper left corner, we've got his diary. He picked this up uh, in 1918. And, uh, and then as well as on the inside cover, he's got a small uh, uh, blue star, of course, a sticker. And then his first date is January 1st, 1918. He's still in Texas at this point. They are not overseas yet. They won't go overseas until I believe it's in uh, isn't, March. Isn't the blue star gold star mothers? Gold star, if it were gold star, yeah, it would be a deceased mother. But he just had uh, the, put that little sticker in there showing that, uh, I'm not quite sure why he put it in. I mean, parents, no, parents would put that the symbol up. is the blue star with the red border. Right. I've seen that before, but it means something, no? Yeah, it means that, for example, when uh, our son was in the service, we had uh, the, uh, the banner that we have hung in our window with a single blue star. Yeah, we always prayed that it would yeah, never yeah. change to a gold, because that would be a bad thing. And uh, up in Lansing, I don't know if in this area you do, but up in the Lansing area there is a, a uh, gold uh, star mother's group that, that meets. Yeah, yes, yeah. and uh, I think it's a really worthwhile thing. And then, of course, the calendar that he just kept with him. Uh, here we've got an example on the top there of a 75-millimeter howitzer unit in action in France. Uh, and down here is the, uh, a uh, map of the defensive sector called the Tool Area. That's where they, their initial uh, start was in World War I when they got to France of the 32nd Division. And then, of course, the switchboard down in the lower right would be something that my grandfather would be very familiar with. And uh, stringing the wire for it, and as you would guess, having to sometimes go out into no man's land or across certain areas, it was very dangerous. One of the things that my grandfather mentions is about running wire at night, getting stuck out in no man's, no man's land because there was a lot of gunfire and stuff, and having to be out there. On June 16, 1918, my grandfather, it was, they had 
this unit at the 119th Battery B had just gotten to the front and they had been working with the French and the French finally said, okay, we for weeks, the French said, okay, we're finally ready to have you go up and do some observation of live action at the front. And so my grandfather and a couple other men from his unit went up to observe, only observe. Uh, it was their first experience at the front and they were in a bunker and then shelling, the Germans started shelling. Not near, anywhere right near them, but they could hear the shelling. So what did they do? They ran outside to see what was going on. And obviously the shells start walking closer and closer to their bunker, so they run in. And in running in, one of the shells exploded close enough, it uh, caught my father, grandfather in the back with a piece of shrapnel, and the young man that was just ahead of him. And uh, both of them were wounded. Uh, my grandfather's wounds were, were listed as pretty severe, and the young man ahead of him, uh, by the name of uh, Louis Heitz, Private First Class, his were uh, listed as minor. As, uh, minor. Uh, he, unfortunately, he would die the next day. He'd be one of the first of the 119th Field Artillery Division to die during World War I. My grandfather would take about seven weeks to recover, and uh, once he did, then he was put back up shortly over the front to continue what he had done before, what he should have done before, which was the running the wire and the communications. And this is a letter, telegram that my uh, great-grandparents would have received from the War Department saying that, uh, that Elmer, my grandfather, was wounded. This is a uh, a picture of the three major, of three of the major combat operations that the 32nd Aero Division was involved in in 1918. Uh, the 119th Field Artillery is heavily, heavily involved in these. So you can see Chateau Thierry, that's probably a name that you may recognize from the whole World War One. Sassans. So these are different areas that they were involved in. And uh, just another picture of the, the Verdun area. This was the Use Argonne of the Offensive, which was one of the last battles of the war in the Argonne Forest area. <clears throat> Up here is on the left, uh, in awards and decorations, my grandfather eventually qualified for his wounded World War I for the Purple Heart. I think it came out sometime in the 1920s, maybe somebody knows. I mean, not too long after World War I. Uh, so we still have that. It's uh, one of our prides that we still have. Uh, it was uh, awarded retroactively to replace the wounded chevron that soldiers have in their sleeve. In the middle is the World War Victory Medal with four battle class for the four major campaigns that the 119th Field Artillery was involved in. And on the right is the Crobiguerre, Pro Pro across the war from the French government. His unit, the 119th Field Artillery, received this award twice for distinguished support to French commands during combat. And so consequently, you get the medal and then the ribbons and the star for being involved twice. Uh, this, uh, the commander of the 119th Field Artillery was Colonel Chester B. McCormick, who had a very distinguished career, and he also received the Distinguished Service Cross. And as you've seen earlier, this is the Victory Parade. Uh, big deal back then. They had given the boys back in World War I. This was on, again on May 13th. And uh, this is just a picture of my mom, good picture of the family. I'm not sure I'm around yet. Uh, my grandfather, uh, John's mother, Sharon, my grandmother, Marge or Marjorie, my mom, and uh, my uncle Steve, who lives out in the Tucson area and sees John quite frequently, and of course their house on, uh, on Miller Road. Anyway, that kind of does the 
the uh, photos. I do have a couple more things I'm going to add. Show this now. You don't know how far back the artillery was from the front, do you? I, no, I don't. And uh, 
in early June is when they arrive at the front near Toul, France, which is a defensive sector at the time. They're not into offense, it's just defense. And uh, Elmer, my grandfather, and a small group are sent to the front to observe some of the French batteries. And on the 16th is when he's wounded. He's only up there for two or three days. And uh, they make some mistake of going out to watch the barrage. Um, and, yet, and as I mentioned, another soldier, uh, Private First Class Lewis Heist of Detroit, uh, was also wounded in the artillery attack. His wounds were listed as slight on his wound card, but he died the next day. So, you, you know, you just don't know. And of course, with the medical abilities back then, it's changed quite a bit. And on uh, July 22nd, so it's over, it's almost seven weeks later, that, or five weeks later, he finally is declared fit for service, but he doesn't actually begin going back to the front until August 9th. So it's been almost two months. Uh, in his diary, which you'll read about, he recorded what all soldiers experienced during life at the front. Suffering through enemy artillery shelling, machine and rifle gun attacks, trench warfare, gas attacks, air bombing, dealing with all sorts of weather, and, as you'll see quite often, just sheer boredom. Nothing's going on. On September 4th, he recorded in his diary, got a little mustard gas while out on the line tonight. Now, you know, everybody knows mustard gas is pretty bad. He did have trouble with his respiratory system his whole life, so when he, he says got a little gas, I, I'm not quite sure what that means, but obviously it was enough to affect him. And of course, on November 11th, uh, Armistice Day, Veterans Day now, he noted in his diary, Hooray! The armistice to Germany was signed at 6 o'clock this morning. Hostilities ceased at 11 o'clock. Black Jack Pershing was right when he said, Hell, heaven, or Hoboken by Christmas. So the 119th uh, was involved, as I mentioned, and as you saw in uh, a few of the pictures there, the map, and also the... Uh, the, the uh, Croix de Guerre with the four uh, bars on it, that there were four major combat operations. They were the, the tool area, the defensive sector, the Mies Eind sector, the Eind Muse sector, and the Muse Argon sector, which ended up concluding the war. And so they remained in France until May of 1919. They caught a ship back. Within two days, they were in Lansing for the victory parade as soon as he came into town. And on May 16th, the private first class, he had been promoted from private to private first class, was discharged from the Army, U.S. Army at Fort Custer. So that kind of concluded his time in the military. But as I had mentioned, of course, he comes back and sees his family, eventually gets married, gets married again later, has kids. He has grandkids, and great grandkids, and great great grandkids. I've got grandchildren, so it's, uh, he'd be really happy with the way the family's turned out. So, uh, uh, and I think he'd be very happy knowing that my cousin had the uh, wherewithal to take his diary and the letters and put it together in a book form that people could read about his experience during World War One. You know, he was a man of his times back in World War One, back in 1919. He, uh, his, his. By today's standards, he wouldn't be considered politically correct on a lot of things, but that's the way it was back then. Uh, he was a, basically a, grew up a farmer, and, uh, and so his insights that you'll read about, if you choose to read the book, it, you'll see pretty much a man of his times, of probably most people back uh, in 1919, 1918, 1917. So anyway. That concludes my part of the presentation, unless you have any questions, or if anyone you would like to share perhaps some of your family stories you remember. Because a lot of what I've shared with you has been shared with me through family stories. Some of it, like I said, I don't always know is true, but that's what's been shared. So, Mike? Yeah, Mark, did you get a chance to see the movie uh, They Shall Not Grow Old? I missed it by this oh, much. Okay, well, and, uh, that's bad news. I, I've heard, everybody I've heard, my, my stepson, Matt, and his wife went, so I said he thought it was one of the best movies he's yeah, ever seen just for cool. that. Okay. Yeah, so it's on my, my bucket list when it comes out for DVD. Excellent. Yeah. Are your family pictures in the book? 
I, excuse me. Yes, yes, and that's a good question. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. But uh, yes, there is a section in the middle, and so many of the pictures you saw in the PowerPoint are also in here. There's also additional pictures in here that I didn't aren't in the PowerPoint presentation. Um, oh, some of the other, the first set of pictures I showed you, not in the PowerPoint, there's a few of them in here, but a lot of them are ones that I put together because, you know, I think it's important that uh, while we know about the soldier and their experience, there's a greater picture. You know, there's a life before and there's a life after. And uh, I think, I might, I, to be honest with you, my mom and I have talked quite a bit. We don't ever remember my grandpa talking much about World War I. Uh, obviously, with the things that he went through, as with any soldier who's in combat, uh, doesn't want to talk about or, or doesn't uh, want to share. We understand that. The only thing I ever remember is I remember one time when I was probably about 10, we were up at the cottage, we were on Spider Lake, and there was a big lightning storm <laughs> south of us. It wasn't over us, it was south of us. And, uh, you can see it way over on the lake and it moving. And it was one of those where it's constant lighting, and you could hear the boom, 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 boom. boom. And my grandpa said, that reminds me of when I was at the front. I thought, I, that's one thing I'll never forget. So, yeah. But, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, so hopefully give you a complete picture of a, a man who uh, uh, was very important for me and uh, for my family, but also can share some things with you about his experience. Yeah. My grandpa's brother was in World War. He was in an artillery unit, too. He's from Michigan. He lived in Grayling. And I don't know if he uh, got drafted or what. He ended up going to Battle Creek. Then they had a parade, like you said, they had yeah. Detroit. But uh, he told me he was never had to do the trenches because he was in the artillery. He said, I was way back. I was away from the fighting. That's what he said. I don't know if he was. He used to make big stories of well, so it. Artillery, the artillery could be a long ways back, fortunately. Yeah, and he said, I never really. He said, we just did the shelling. <laughs> To worry about the trench. Having to get in the trench and fight. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. said, stay pretty clean. That's what he said. Anybody else? Yes. Do you know what base hospital he went to when he was injured? I don't. But it might be in the book, but I don't. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the other thing was the 32nd that he was in. Um, and then in your, your uh, PowerPoint, it said it was Lansing's home. Yes. And, um, and I, was that a comment? No, that's the 119th, is actually Lansing's home. Oh, okay. 119 field artillery. It's it's still based out of there. Now it was mostly Michigan men in there. Mostly Michigan men. To my understanding, it might have been all Michigan men. I, I, I think during World War One, they still used a lot state of units. of state units. And obviously, being a Michigan National Guard unit, it would be Michigan people probably. Whether they incorporated more as they got ready to go overseas, I don't know. Uh, but at least initially it was a Michigan unit, and in particular the 119th was born out of Lansing itself. Uh, I happened to do, when John wrote the book, uh, back in 1915 and, and, and uh, towards uh, Veterans Day, I happened to do a presentation to uh, the Michigan National Guard, the 119th. And, and, uh, and of course they got some much bigger guns nowadays that we can use to do stuff like that. But, uh, it was, it, I, they really enjoyed it because it's like they could look back and say, oh, there's one of our own, so, yeah. So that's probably where that came from. Yes, sir? Did your grandfather lose a lot of his hearing and have him served in the Arcova? You know, I, I don't think so. Uh, I, I never really, I really, never really recognized that he had a problem hearing growing up. He could hear you okay. He could hear okay, yeah. He could hear me okay, he could hear other people. Like you pointed out, though, the guns weren't as big as they were. Right, right. Well, and, and I think a lot of his work was actually right up in the trenches area rather than back at the, the guns. I, as I understand it, his responsibility was running the wire out between gun batteries so, so that they could communicate board. and that he would man a switchboard in case they needed to communicate to other units because, you know, I, I would think probably telephones back then were still pretty rudimentary in terms of how you would use it. So I could see him, well, you know, I need to speak to battery C. Okay, you know, and then he's got the headphones. Okay, now I need to speak to the commander's, I need to speak to battery D. So I could see probably him operating like that at some point. But I also do know that he had the, there's a couple points where, he, there are a couple spots where he talks about, you know, stringing wire through no man's land. So that's, 
So I think he was probably more up front, and, and if any uh, noise he was getting, it was probably either uh, the arti our artillery coming in or their artillery coming to on the, on the trenches and stuff. But his biggest problem his whole life was uh, his heart. And that's, he had, a, in 1968, November, he had a massive heart attack. Uh, the, the spring before, the February before, when I showed you the picture, he looked very skinny. That was the time when he had his, uh, a good heart attack, but it didn't kill him. The one in November did. And, uh, I, we, we think a lot of that has to do with that piece of shrapnel that never came out, was so close to his heart. Any other questions? Well, if anybody's interested in purchasing a book, I do have copies. They're $15. I do have some change if you need it. Uh, if not, I still, I appreciate very much uh, the opportunity to talk to you about my grandfather and about his experience. And maybe you can walk away with uh, some knowledge that we didn't have before. So thank you for your patience. Too. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. And I understand there, I've gone through it. It's a beautiful museum.